All right. Well, again, welcome everyone to Open Arms Community Church. We want to invite you to open up your program to the outline of today's discussion. We are in part two of a series that, as I said last week, is probably one of the most relevant topics that we have talked about. I mean, there are many globally relevant topics that we do talk about here, but a lot of times um, our topics are contextualized to our American lifestyle, to our Bradfordian culture, but this particular issue is one that every human being on the face of the planet has to deal with and address, and that is, what does God want me to do? We are, life is full of of choices. Life is full of decisions that we have to make of where will we go to school and and what job will we take and who are we going to marry and are these friends the right friends for me? Time and time again, we struggle, especially if we are followers of Jesus, we struggle with with, uh, an, an itch in our heart that's a very difficult one to scratch because we, we want to do the right thing, but we're just unsure. At least we think we're unsure. And the goal of this series is to equip us and give us the tools necessary to accurately discern what is God's will and to make sure, just as importantly, that we're not fooling ourselves into thinking we don't know God's will. Because what I have found is that many times it's not an issue of us not knowing what is the right decision. The problem many times is we don't like the answer. And so we are looking for an alternative route, okay? So you'll remember last week, the analogy we started off with was that we are, you know, on a journey, right? And we use the analogy of being in a vehicle and having the radio. And are we getting God's signal? Are we dialed into the right station? And are we staying within the, um, the, the, the geography, the limit of where that signal is broadcasting? And when it comes to knowing God's will, friends... We said that we learned that the very first source that God has given every human being is is the Word of God. This is the number one source that you and I are going to go to to determine what is God's will. The Bible is God's authoritative word for all humanity. It communicates the general will of God for every human being on the face of this planet. So when you crack open the Bible, you find God's directions, instructions, and commands that apply to every one of us. So when I want to know, is it right? I'm really angry right now, and I want to jack slap that guy. Is that okay? And so when I open up the Bible and I see that it says, be angry, but do not sin. When I see that it says to turn the other cheek. When I see that it says, do not lie, do not steal, do not commit adultery. Those are all things that apply to every one of us. Okay? Not just a few of us. So that is God's general will for all mankind. But what you won't find in the Bible is, you know, when I open up those pages... And I say, Jesus, who is it that I'm supposed to marry? You don't find it in there. Mike, I want you to marry Marnie. And I want you to have this number of children. I want you to uh, work at this place. That's not in there. Go to this school. That's not in there. So how do we discern? How do we know what God wants us to do? So here we are on life's journey We've got our radio. Remember, the radio is our heart, right? And we're to dial that in to God's station. And there are many stations out there. Their world is full of opinions and and ideas and philosophies and even spiritualities. We need to zero in on God's station. 
And then we need to not only submit to God's station, turn into it, dial it in, but we need to commit to that station that we're not going to start wandering off to other stations and listening to other voices that will tell us what we want to hear instead of what we need to hear. But also we commit to stay within the geography of that broadcasting area. Where is it that God wants us to live in and operate in so that we are hearing God's signal loud and clear? See, when I decide to go off of outside of God's geography and I do things like lie, steal, drunkenness, sexual immorality, then guess what? The station starts to get fuzzy. And I have a difficult time hearing and hearing clearly exactly what God is communicating to me. Now, here's the crazy part. The problem is not God. He is everywhere, all the time, communicating. He is broadcasting at all times. The problem is, is that the geography we're discussing has less to do with the physical geography, although there are some places we just should not go. It has more to do with the geography of the heart. Okay? It has more to do with the geography of the heart. And when you think about this fact, right? So the Bible is God's word. It's the number one source and authority for guidance and direction. We can always refer back to it. And yet, think about how little time we actually give to it, right? And even when we do read it, think about the times of how we neglect, we ignore what it says, or we just, we neglect it, or we outright violate it. We know God says, don't do these things, but we choose to do them anyway, right? So it's no wonder that our very first principle in being able to discern the will of God has to do with you and me, has to do with the internal parts, not external issues. It's an internal issue of whether or not you and I hear God's voice clearly, whether you and I discern God's will for our lives clearly and accurately. Because the truth is, is God wants you to know his will more than you want to know it. So the key issue in knowing God's will isn't God, it's you, it's me. It's issues of our heart, okay? Because remember this, some people, they think, well, maybe if I you know, just read the Bible. Well, reading the Bible is a part of it. Maybe if I just go to church. Well, going to church is a part of it. But you can go to church, you can read your Bible, you can pray, you can hang out with Christians and still not do God's will for your life. Why? Because your heart isn't in it. And I see that all the time. So this leads us to our second component, our second ingredient or factor in knowing the will of God. It's in your outlines, and that is this. And this is essential. To know the will of God, we must live in the fear of the Lord. So last week, we learned we need to submit and commit to God. This week, to know the will of God, we must live in the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? To live in the fear of the Lord. Well, first of all, again, I want you to notice that this is an internal issue, not an external issue. And you're going to find that knowing the will of God for your life, again, has little to nothing to do with the external factors. We're always wanting to, you know, blame the church. Well, you know, I don't get fed there. Or it's the, um, the friends that I'm hanging around. It's the, the place that I live in. It's just so spiritually dark and oppressive. Listen, there may be some truth to every one of those, but none of them supersede your own personal walk with Jesus. Okay? None of them. Are you seeking 
Are you submitting and committing to the Lord? And are you walking in the fear of the Lord? So what does that phrase mean? Well, it means a great deal. The word fear is like a two-sided coin, if you notice in your outlines. In the definition of fear, we find that it has two meanings. A, it means a deep, reverential awe and respect. Now, most times we think that that particular portion of the definition of fear applies to believers, Christians, followers of Jesus, okay? So they, because of their recognition of who God is and what he has done, they stand in awe of God and revere him, have a deep respect for him and how they live. The latter part of the definition, letter B, is the obvious one, terror, right? To be, you know, it's an anxiousness, to be fearful, afraid, terrorized. Now, most times people apply this aspect of the definition to non-believers, non-Christians, non-followers of Jesus. And and with good reason, they say, hey, you know what? And we're going to see it in a moment. We should be afraid of judgment. We should be afraid of going to hell. That's a terrible, terrible place. And it's real. But I want to, first of all, show you in Scripture the contrast between the two definitions. I want you to see that both sides of fear have a role in our world. And I want you to see something else about the two aspects of fear as well. It's that it's not as narrowly applied as we might think where Christians live in just this simple awe of God, and the non-Christians are to be terrorized at the thought of living eternity without Him, okay? So, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. That phrase, reverence for God, is the phrase, the fear of the Lord. So we are to purify ourselves and live a holy life out of the fear of the Lord, okay? So this reverence, this deep respect and awe of God is to be the motivating factor for me to live life God's way, okay? That's what it means to live a holy and pure life, is to live life God's way. Now, we compare that with Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is speaking here, and he says, do not be afraid. So we're talking about the other side of fear now, where you're in terror. He says, do not be afraid or in terror of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Instead, Fear the one, be afraid, be in terror of the one who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Okay? There is this being afraid side of fear as well. And most people will apply that to a non-follower of Jesus. And again, Notice Hebrews chapter 10 says, it is a terrifying thing. Other translations say a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, these last two portions of Scripture that address fear on the side of the terror definition... Most of us want to say, so as a non-Christian, you should be very afraid of hell. And listen, that is partly true. I mean, we should not take lightly eternity being damned to hell. I mean, it is a scary, terrifying thing. However, Jesus in Matthew 10 was actually speaking to the crowd who were following him. Okay? And... If that wasn't clear enough, Hebrews chapter 10 is specifically written to Christians. And the context of Hebrews chapter 10 is that it was saying, listen, Christian, 
Do not take lightly this gift of salvation that God has given you. Do not take lightly your decision to engage again in a lifestyle of sin. To take lightly living life the way God says to and and instead becoming like everybody else again. Don't do this casually or lightly because there's a great and grave danger. And it goes on to give a, a, a very powerful warning to us as Christians who decide to drift from the course that God would have us walk. So don't be, as a follower of Jesus, don't be quick to apply the fearful side of fear, the terrorized side of fear, strictly and narrowly to the non-Christian world. Because in truth, as a follower of Jesus, there should be a deep reverential respect and awe of God for sure, but there should also be a, a sensitivity, a keen awareness that this gift of God is not to be taken lightly. It is a very serious thing. And it is a relationship that I can decide to enter into, and it is a relationship that I can abandon. Again, the word that God uses to describe what we enter into by His saving grace, this salvation... The word that God used, that Jesus used to describe it is covenant. And it is the same word that God uses to describe a marriage relationship. It is called the marriage covenant. And friends, just as you and I can decide that we love a person and we are going to commit ourselves and devote the rest of our lives to one another until death do us part, Right? Just as we make those commitments, but then over time begin to start to drift from those commitments and decide, this isn't for me. I, I'm not happy anymore. I don't really love this person anymore. I don't want to be married to them anymore. I want a divorce. And we can violate that covenant and we can destroy that covenant. We can abandon it in the same way we can violate and we can abandon our covenant with God. And Hebrews 10, specifically, and many other portions of Scripture, God addresses that very reality. So when it comes to the fear of the Lord, friends... This is a very, very important subject, so much so we devoted a whole series about a year ago to this one topic, and it's out on our DVD collection there. You can check it online or check it out there. It's called The Fear of the Lord, and it goes into great detail on this subject of the fear of the Lord, which we're not going to do today. So the question is then, now that we've got a clear picture on the fear of the Lord, is how does this apply? Not only to my life, but how does this apply to me knowing God's will for my life? So let's look at some answers. Number one, the fear of the Lord equips us with God's perspective on life. Proverbs 9 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So the first role that the fear of the Lord has in your life and in mine is it's kind of like a light switch. How many would recognize and admit the electricity is always in the lines. I mean, barring an accident that cuts the lines, right? We've got electricity running through the building all the time but yet the lights are not on all the time. What is it that empowers those bulbs to begin to illuminate the room? It's not the electricity. The electricity is there. It's the switch. 
that turns it on, that allows that electricity to flow into the bulb, okay? There's a scripture in Proverbs that says, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, okay? So when you and I notice the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So when you and I decide that we're going to live a life in the fear of the Lord, we flip the switch so that wisdom, the electricity of wisdom and understanding are now free to flow into our lives and the spirit of man becomes the lamp of the Lord, illuminated. Our life is no longer lived in darkness where we're just kind of groping and grasping, what, what am I supposed to do next now? The lights go on. I can see clearly now. The rain is gone. No, I'm joking. I get to see clearly now. This is starting to make sense because now I'm seeing things as God sees them. Because the wisdom that I was operating on was a wisdom of darkness. It was a worldly wisdom, a wisdom that has its source in a broken race of creatures that are finite at best. We are limited beings who don't know everything. We philosophize and come up with all kinds of ideas on how life is supposed to live and function. We've got all kinds of opinions most of them are in direct contradiction to God. And so we run around, the Bible describes us as running around life with blinders on. But it says that the light of Christ pierces the veil. And friends, when you and I decide that God is worthy, of our deep reverential awe and respect for who he is and for what he has done, all of a sudden the switch gets flipped because now I'm living my life not only in respect toward God in all that I do, I want to honor and please him, but I now begin to see life as he sees it. I begin to understand why he says these certain things are bad and wrong. And it's not because God's a killjoy and wants to ruin all of our fun and make us a miserable people. It's because he knows that path leads to destruction. I did not grow up a Christian. I grew up in a town where there were no police. In fact, it was a town that people moved to specifically after the Vietnam conflict because they were a bunch of hippies that did not want any government entanglements. They wanted the freedom to live, to party, and to do whatever it is they wanted to do and how they wanted to do it without any infringement from the authorities. So it was a pretty crazy place. I grew up in the wisdom of the world, with those blinders on that I described, thinking that partying, that drugs and alcohol abuse, that sexual immorality, that cussing and swearing and fighting were all just normal that they were fun, that they were cool, that, that there was nothing fun or cool if there weren't drugs and alcohol, sex and violence. And when I saw Christians at a distance, their life seemed so boring and dull. Ugh. They are a confused people. They talk about joy and, ooh, no, no, this is fun. Well, guess what? It wasn't fun. Well, I get it. It was fun. But it was destructive. The Bible refers to sin as being sweet to the taste, a moment of pleasure, but in the end, as bitter as gall. Destructive. When you walk in the fear of the Lord, the light goes on. 
And I remember all of a sudden realizing, holy cow, all of my friends, I, I looked at some of them, there, some of them were in their 60s and 50s and they were wasted away from the drug and alcohol abuse. Their lives never amounted to anything. They just existed in a place of self-destruction. I watched some of my closest friends go from being a child of unlimited potential, smarter than me, more talented than me. I mean, they had everything going for them and they ended up a junkie because that was fun. And all of a sudden, fun was no longer just an issue of when I choose, it became their life. They became chains they could not break. And, and now a young man whose uh, talent and giftedness could have brought him great worldly achievement, his highest ambition at the age of early 20s was to climb a radio tower and get high. That was one of my childhood friends that I led into the party scene. You know, when you enter into the fear of the Lord, when you decide that God's way is the right way and that Jesus is Lord and He's worthy of our wholehearted devotion, and we're going to do life His way, and that His wisdom is the authority over all other forms of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, the switch goes on, the lights go on, and all of a sudden you see things a whole lot more clearly. Second reason the fear of the Lord is important in knowing the will of God is that the fear of the Lord literally conforms our will to his will. In other words, friends, I want what he wants now. Okay? So it's no longer that God wants me to do this, but I want to do that. And we are having a chafing moment. Sparks are flying. It's no longer that God is wanting me to go this direction and I'm fighting him because I want to go that direction. Now, my heart is conforming to his heart. I love what he loves. I hate what he hates. And this, friends, brings great internal conflict as you are starting your journey with God. Because you have to unlearn the old ways of looking at things and thinking about things and doing things. So when I first became a Christian, coming out of that scene, it seemed very hard and, and even just completely irrational and, 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 and outlandish that God would ask us not to have sex before we're married. That, to me, I was just like, uh, God, everybody else is doing it. Feels good. It's fun. But you know what? So when I first became a Christian, I now knew the command. And God wanted me to go this way. And guess what? As a brand new baby believer, it wasn't that... I wanted to go this way, and so I was fighting God. You want to know what it was? Is that in my heart, I knew what was right, and I knew what was wrong, and I wanted to do what was right. I wanted to do it God's way. I wanted to please Him, but there was a part of me that had to break away from the old ways, the old line of thinking, the old value system that's actually called the degrading of women in premarital sex as fun. The devaluing of people, turning them into nothing more than animals by having sex before we were married as fun. Okay? I, had to, I began to align my values with God and His ways. And so it changes everything. Notice in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue 
to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So notice, the fear of the Lord is to be motivating us to not just accept salvation, put it in our pocket and forget about it, but actually live it out, grow up in it, work it out on a day-to-day basis all the way to the very end of our life's last breath. The fear of the Lord. Notice, with fear and trembling, there is a weightiness to this, a seriousness to living out life God's way. But notice why. The result. It's not because be afraid, do this, or else God's going to throw you in hell. No, that's not the motivating factor. Notice verse 13. Why should we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? For it is God who works in you to will and to act, underline that phrase, to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purposes. So notice here, friends, God, when you and I submit and commit our lives to the rule of Jesus, and we make a decisive decision to live a life in the fear of the Lord, that we will choose to have a deep reverence and respect and awe for God and work out our salvation accordingly, what begins to happen happen is our heart, remember the radio, begins to be conformed to God's likeness and image, to His will, so that now... We're looking at things as he looks at them. We're feeling about things the way he feels about them. And it's really, I know, hard to even begin to fathom if you're on the front end of things. But, you know, the things that used to bring me pleasure, the things that I would look at and think, man, that would be awesome. Now I look at them and I cringe. Things that I used to do for pleasure, I look back upon it and I feel not just an embarrassment sometimes, but I feel sick. I feel sickened at the way we used to behave and the things we used to do and say. Because even though it brought a moment of pleasure, it hurt people and it dishonored God. So when I walk in the fear of the Lord, my life, my heart begins to become conformed to His heart. And I begin to not only see things the way he sees them, but I want what he wants. I love what he loves, and I hate what he hates. Now, the danger for the Christian as we go through life is is that we will decide to follow Jesus, and we we may even decide to have that deep respect for God. But inevitably, we live in a natural world where there are all kinds of opportunities and choices to be made, all types of pleasures and treasures to pursue. And so the danger, the temptation in life is to get our focus off of God and onto the things of the world. In other words, to drift in your affections. Remember, marriage, right? So you step up to the the altar and you say, I do until death do us part. But then what happens is that over time, all of a sudden, your relationship that was once so passionate, once you were so attracted to them and you had such great affection for them, and then all of a sudden now, you don't. And in fact... This person over here, you, you actually are kind of excited to go and spend time with them. It might be a person at work. It might be a friend, a neighbor. But all of a sudden, we feel a, an enthusiasm and an excitement about going and seeing this person, going and talking with that person. We start to feel not only an attraction to them, but we start to feel an affection for them. And slowly, sometimes, fast, 
in a, in a faster pace, our affection and our loyalties begin to drift from our commitment, our covenant, to this other person. And that's what happens in our life with Jesus is our temptations. We, we start out zealously for the Lord, passionate for Jesus, and then all of a sudden, after time goes on, Jesus becomes normal, bland. Our reverence, our fear of the Lord begins to kind of die down. So the respect and the, the desire to please and honor begin to settle. And all of a sudden, this thing over here, this opportunity over here looks far more interesting, far more fun and attractive. And we drift. And this is what God tells us, Proverbs 23, do not let your heart envy sinners. Don't stand around and look at them and feel envy, feel a jealousy, feel a discontentedness, a resentful longing that is aroused because of their success, because of their possessions, because of the lifestyle they seem to live and have so much fun in. God says, don't envy the sinner. Don't look at them and go, gee, I wish I could have that kind of fun. I wish I could do those kinds of things. I wish I could have the stuff they have, live the life they live. Listen, no, you don't. No, you don't. Because number one, it's not everything that it looks like. And number two, God has given you a very clear and honest assessment of where it's going to take you. And it is no place you want to go in this life or the next. So do not let your heart envy sinners, but always, get this, always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. So do not let your heart envy sinners. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 says, Do not love this world or anything in this world. For the things of this world, the, love of the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, do not come from the Father, but from this world. And the things of this world will pass away, but the man who does the will of God will live forever. So don't envy in your heart the life of a sinner. Instead, always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. The word zeal means to, to have this intense enthusiasm or fervor, okay? And And I remember when I first became a Christian, I was very excited about Jesus. I got it. I understood what he did for me. And I said, yes, absolutely, unreservedly, I am yours and you are mine. And in my enthusiasm and my zeal and passion for Jesus, I was going around, you know, serving the Lord and telling people about Christ. And I remember there were several older Christians that would pat me on the back and go, oh, Mike, you're so zealous. You know, one day you'll calm down. One day you'll mature and you'll, you'll be a little more balanced. Well, I am older. I've been serving Jesus for over 25 years and I am older, and yes, I am a little more balanced, but I can tell you that I am as zealous today in my devotion to Jesus as I was when I first got saved after 25 years. Why? Because I understood something. The day that those, I remember this older guy, he patted me on the back and he said that to me, "You'll, you'll calm down, you'll mellow out. And I said, no, I won't. And he goes, well, what makes you think so? And this was not something that I wasn't smart at the time. I'm still, you know, struggle with that one. Um, It was just that God spoke in that moment into my life. And I told him, I said, because zeal is a choice. And I choose to be zealous for the Lord always. I, uh, don't ask me what, how I knew that, because at the time I was not as, as knowledgeable of the Bible. I was brand new to the faith, but yet here it is. Notice what it said, Proverbs 23, always be zealous 
for the fear of the Lord. Now, how can, you, how can God command that you always be zealous for the Lord if it's a feeling? Can you control your feelings? No. You can control your behavior in a moment of feeling. So when you're angry, you don't actually hit the person. That's controlling your behavior, not your feeling. Okay? Feelings come and feelings go. So if zeal is a feeling, well, then how could God command such a thing? Well, it's not. By God giving us the command to always be zealous for the Lord, He tells us something about zeal. It's a decision. It's a choice. And sadly, we're not as intentional as we need to be, and so our zeal does die down. But it is, if we're going to be zealous always, it is an intentional choice. Now, to wrap things up, regarding the fear of the Lord and how to know the will of God, it plays a significant role. But I do want to mention one other thing about the fear of the Lord, and that is that there are many promises for those who fear the Lord. So many that I don't have time to even or space to list them all and talk about them all. I've given you a reference list down below, but there's one in particular that relates to knowing the will of God for your life. Are you ready? This is so huge. If you get this, it'll change your life. In Psalm 25, it says this, the Lord confides, circle the word confides, in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. So this relationship that you and I have entered into, that's kind of like a marriage. And what, what did we say last week? That, you know, you don't know that person fully when you step up to the altar and say, I do. And in like manner, you, when you make a commitment to follow Jesus, you don't fully know God. You don't fully understand everything about him. Just as you don't fully know and understand the person you stepped up to the altar with and married. It takes years and years and years to really get to know that person. And what then would that mean about getting to know an infinite God? Oh, friends, we can spend a hundred years growing in our relationship with God Almighty and just scratch the surface on who He is. But all of that said, notice that the fear of the Lord, based on Psalm 25, the fear of the Lord literally positions you to be God's confidant. Did you catch the first part of that? The Lord confides in those who fear Him. The word confide means to tell secrets or private information. Do you want to be God's confidant? The kind of person that God can trust with His classified information? His top secret stuff? In America, we have top secret things, and, and you have to go through clearances. You've got to be proven to be an individual who is trustworthy with those kinds of secrets and information. And so you get a certain clearance, and there are different levels of top secret clearances. So you may be cleared for one level of secret stuff, but there's other secret stuff that you're not cleared for, right? Right? The fear of the Lord is that quality. It is that clearance level that makes you a confidant to God Almighty. And that right there, if you just meditate, think about that verse of Scripture over the next week and all that it implies. I mean, not only does it imply that God will tell you His secrets, it means that you can hear. That you're interacting and relating with God. That you have this kind of intimate relationship. I mean, think about a secret. It means that you either A, get alone with that person, right? 
You've got that kind of relationship that you guys just get along with one another and talk about things that other people are not privy to. It also means that sometimes, even in the midst of the crowd, they're communicating, but they're communicating in ways that only you pick up. They might give you a look, and because you know them, you get it. They might whisper into your ear. Nobody else is privy to that. You get to hear it. Can you imagine that kind of intimacy with God? Where he's not just telling you things about your own life, but he's speaking into your life about other things, things that are on his heart, on his mind about people that you know, about people you don't know. He invites you to come and be a part of what he wants to do in your community and in your world. God confides in. He tells his secrets to those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. We want to know the will of God. Are we the kind of person that God can confide that information to? Hey, Mike, I want you to marry this person. Hey, Mike, I don't want you to go to those schools. I want you to go to this school. That happened. I was accepted at two different schools. Bible colleges. I was totally pumped about going to one of them. And God said, neither. Nobody understood that. I didn't fully understand it. And instead, over the next couple of months, I'm praying and seeking God. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And he says, over here. Are we in a position to hear God? Are we in a position for him to whisper his secrets into our lives? Or is our life full of all the other voices, dialed into all the other stations but his station? Are we full of awe at what the world has to offer us and how other people live their lives? Do we have great respect for the things of this world but little to no respect for God? I watched a crowd of people run up to the stage of popular musicians. They yell and scream their name. They hope to just touch them. Others, the opportunity to talk to them. I stood in line for a long time so that you could get their autograph or have your picture taken with them. Let me tell you something, friends. Somebody more famous, more awesome, and more amazing is living right with you and wants to be a part of your life and has your best in mind. How are you going to handle that person? What are you going to do? How will you respond to them? Are you going to scream their name? Are you going to chase after them? Are you willing to wait in the long lines? Are you willing to do what you need to do to get close? Because we do that with fellow human beings. How much more should we do that with God? Where's our awe of the Lord? What are we zealous for? What do we have a deep reverence or respect for? What are we chasing after and zealously pursuing? What is it that we greatly value or stand in awe of? What are we chasing after above other things? What are we afraid to lose? What is it we can't live without? 
many of us seem to do just fine living without Jesus. Or so we think. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One, understanding. You want to know God's will for your life? Flip the switch. Make the choice, the decision to fear God and let wisdom begin to flow into your life and bring illumination so the lights can go on and you can see clearly and accurately the world before you and the decisions to be made. Amen? Let's pray. As we prepare to go to God in prayer, I just sense in my heart that God is um, God is speaking. Of course, He is to every one of us in this room, but but for some of us, God is speaking because we we are hearing, but He's He's kind of chipping away at our heart today. And we're in a place to recognize it. We're we're in this place where we are wanting to do our own thing. We have a belief in God. But our heart is still pretty much consumed with ourself. With what we want. Our heart is still pretty much enamored with and in love with what this world has to offer us. And so while we have made the pledge, the devotion to Jesus to say, I do until death do us part, we're we're like that spouse whose affections are starting to drift, who is starting to have their eye caught by something else that is attractive. Our enthusiasm is starting to die down for our first love, and it's beginning to get stirred over other things and other people. And I want to close our time by praying and, and taking the opportunity for us to commit our lives to Christ. Uh, it wasn't my intention, but I just sense in my heart that we need to do that. So, obviously, if there's anybody here who has never made a commitment to Christ, never made those vows to be a lover of God, I want to invite you to to pray a simple prayer that's like taking your marriage vows to Jesus. But some of us in this room, like I said, we've made those vows, but we need to renew them. We've drifted astray, and God is calling us back to Him. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to pray this same prayer. So, along with our entire church family, so that we're all in this together, would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Father God, thank you for loving me and pursuing me and giving me this precious gift of life eternal with you. I confess that I have lived selfishly, that I have loved the things of this world, and that I have pursued them over you. I have hurt myself, and I have hurt others, and I have hurt you, and I was wrong. Please forgive me. Today I make this vow 
that Jesus is Lord of my life, my first love, to whom I fully devote my entire life to. All that I am and all that I have is yours. I want to live my life your way in the fear of the Lord to please and to honor you and to experience your best for my life. Help me to keep these vows with all my heart and to never stray, to never fall away. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.